And we should be live. All right. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Deadhead Land show. <laughs> Things are as normal going a little bit off uh, schedule, but we're we're ready to go now. And uh, welcome, everyone. Hi, my name is Happy Cat, and I'm here to have a little conversation with uh, my friends uh, Bob Braylov and uh, uh, TC, Tom Constantin, uh, both of which who have been with the Grateful Dead, um, and that's probably why we know them, uh, probably why you're tuning in. Uh, here's a little bit about what they're, uh, what's going on with them from Dennis McNally. Um, Persistence of Memory is the latest documentation of the always fascinating ongoing encounter of two remarkable musical minds, keyboardist Bob Brelov and Tom T.C. Constantin, also known as Dos Hermanos. Though both came to prominence associated with the Grateful Dead, Tom is keyboard player from 68 to 70, and Bob is an engineer, programmer, and occasional performer from 87 to 95, this music is dead like only in its wide open, holy improvisational exploration of a vast musical universe with only one rule. Does the result, said Brelov, feel like dose? Anyways, I'd just like to say that I've been listening to the new record by these guys. It's been in my car for the last uh, six weeks. I gave it the car test and it's great. It's really creative, wild. It takes you in all sorts of different places. And uh, anyways, ladies and gentlemen, TC and Bob from Dos Hermanos. Hi, guys. Hi. Good to see you. Hi. Good and to hear you. <laughs> Good to yeah. see you and hear you. Yeah, we had a little bit of a sound mix up there. And uh, uh, TC, it's really great to talk to you, actually. I, um, uh, I know we've been Facebook friends for a while, but I don't know if we've ever actually met in person, although uh, I have seen you perform a few times. Um, remember, you used to come to Southern California a bit in the in the late 90s. You performed with a, a few bands there a few times and uh, always really enjoyed what you brought. Um, creativity and and fun piano music where you would mix in all sorts of different elements, very improvisational back then, and uh, always always a pleasure. So thank you, and it's it's nice to meet you. That's very kind of you. Thank you for your sweet words. Yeah, and uh, and also I, I saw your post this morning about Scott Guberman and really just enjoyed you. Yeah, he's one of my best friends, so it was great to see that. And, Wonderful. Yeah. Well, say him a lot if you see him first, which you probably. Will. <laughs> <laughs> and and Bob, I know we've we've met several times, and I, I remember seeing you at the Monkey House. You did this really creative thing. Oh, yeah. two years ago with. Uh, uh, David. David Gans and Phil Seville, and uh, that was wild. Um, that was fun. That was fun. Wonderful little spot, you know, that place. Just great. Yeah. They're still going. I really, uh, I like what Ira does there. It's a very cool little local venue, small and intimate, and uh, I love that he's keeping it going. So It's amazing that he yeah. he has that, that ability to keep a, a place like that happening. It's wonderful. Yeah, well, very cool. And and like I mentioned, both of you did some time with the Grateful Dead, and that's of course why I I know you and why people here perhaps are tuning in. Um, and like Dennis had said in his little blurb there, the main connection is the improvisational music. And uh, kind of curious, what what does that um what does that mean to you? Improvisational music. I mean, anybody can, I can I don't know how to play. I could sit at it keyboard and just bang and make noise, and maybe once in a while it might sound good. But coming from a perspective of a musician what what is that how would you call define that improvisational music either I, one of you i would define it as jumping into the deep end of the pool and not knowing what to expect next uh, and it goes way way back j.s bach beethoven were known as improvisers they would just make stuff up off the top of their heads and at any given time they might decide oh hey i'll take this road it, all those decisions were made in real time. Whereas when you're playing most songs and a lot of sheet music, uh, it's all predetermined for you. You don't get that opportunity to make creative choices, which is very dose. We do that all the time. Mm -hmm. Whatever is not yeah. prohibited is compulsory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it, it, I mean, uh, it, it's a, it is actually kind of a vague term because it's imp improv improvisation means you're making something up. 
that could be making just a little bit up or a lot up. Mm -hmm. You know, jazz players improvise around uh, song structures and chords. Uh, you, you see symphonic works where there's one piece of it that the, the uh, uh, musicians can choose. They can choose the octave that they're playing that thing in mm -hmm. or how loud or how soft. And so each time the performance happens, it sounds different. We try to take that to the fullest extent that we can. And for me, I mean, Tom has seen it in many, many situations. That has, was never as profound uh, an experience as an observer for me as space with the Grateful Dead, mm -hmm. where you had absolutely no idea where they were gonna go. And for me as a, a supporting, they used a lot of my sounds during space. So supporting that, it was just such an exciting thing to be on your toes at that moment mm -hmm. and to see when is the right time to throw something in or to change something. Or when somebody's digging something, you just want to, the sound that they're playing, you just want to let them go until they exhaust the idea. And for me, that was a huge turnaround. It, also, the other thing is, uh, the Grateful Dead allowed all kinds of music and it was never so great a choice as it was in space because uh, Jerry could come out and uh, play a line from uh, a classical piece or from Star Wars or from anything mm -hmm. and everybody just, oh, look what's in the road, let's dance around that. Or I don't wanna play it like that. You're gonna to have to put that in another context if you wanna use that. I'm gonna show you where it goes. And that kind of playfulness and adventureness, adventuresomeness of, of, of the approach to playing is what we try to capture as Dos Hermanos. Okay. Well, you know, for me, when I uh, was seeing the Grateful Dead, and admittedly, I'm I'm a latter day Deadhead, so really, Bob, your period of time was my big chunk of time with the Grateful Dead. Really, mine too. Uh, I always looked forward <laughs> to space. Drums and space to me was like the peak. And people that would like get up and oh, drums! I'm going to go get a beer and use the bath. I'm like, wait, this is the best part of the show. To me, and this is just my my metaphor. Really, it was like you know, it was like a. a building, 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 tension release, tension release, almost, you know, if, if, if it was like sex, the drums part was like, that's when it's really getting intense. And then the space that would just be, oh, now, you know, we're just like gliding into the bliss as, you know, the post-orgasm bliss and just floating with it, you know, to use that as a metaphor. And but truthfully for me, that was the, the peak of the show, whether psychedelically enhanced or not, that was the moment I was going for, I loved all the songs, but that's what I was building to. That was the, 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 the peak moment of the show for me. Um, and I loved the adventuresomeness of it. You never knew where it was going to go or what it was going to be or what the mood or flavor was. And then also the coming down, what song are they going to come into? So that, that was always very exciting to me. So anyways, thank you from my perspective for that part of it uh, and your contributions there. Um, I enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you <laughs> for paying my salary. Very good. Very good. It's great stuff. So, but, but for me, I, I love, I've always loved like chaotic music, maybe not chaotic music, but outside music stuff, you know, from the art ensemble to Chicago to Sun Ra to um, some stuff that might just be pure cacophony, but I, I get something from that, but maybe other people don't. Um, uh, compared to like the Grateful Dead space, I find Dos Hermanos actually frequently it's a little bit more musical and approachable for people do you do you have a structure to the songs once you've explored it like is oh we're going to do this one again and there's a certain structure that we're going to work within or is every performance just off off the charts you don't know what it's going to be both of the above <laughs> we we have a couple of uh, I wouldn't call them songs musical places uh, clearings in the forest that we like to return to. And it's sort of like the same piece. Sometimes it's even a similar one to another as Grateful Dead songs on adjacent nights. You know how they could change. Mm -hmm. uh, look at the tempo change in Cold Rain and Snow. 
just for one example. And uh, there are those few bases that we know that we can return to. However, a lot of times we just go out there and see what we can find. And it's amazing that we can find stuff. There is stuff out there to be find, found. There's like a, a, a human melos, a, a, a gene pool of melodies that connect in their own way. And it's like they've been there forever. Uh, like I've said about Dark Star, which is also highly improvisatory. Mm -hmm. But it's not a piece that we so much began and ended, but we entered it midstream and flowed for a while. Uh huh. And that's very much like what we do. Uh, you know, and I, I have to say, I'm a, uh, I'm just a amateur musician. I, I uh, play a little bit of bass, and Dark Star is a fun one for me to play because the the basic notes are really simple. And I get that that it can really go anywhere. I mean, it's actually it's it's very very simple, and yet the depth is amazing. So that part I definitely get. Um, how do you how do you define then a, a a song or a track to make an album from that? We wait for oh. it, kind of for us. <laughs> uh, Bob can tell you. Well, it, I mean, pretty much we listen to the recordings. I mean, we're both composers. So we are looking for structure while we're playing. Does this feel like time to return to something? Or does it feel like a time to leave something? And we play through that as performing composers. And when we listen back, we look for sections that are really seem to feel like they have a, a personal sense of satisfaction and a musical sense of satisfaction. And when we feel like we've, that has been achieved, that is the piece, the piece that we might, uh, sometimes, sometimes it, 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 it goes from the first note to the not last note perfectly. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you may have to edit out the beginning because the idea of the real idea didn't quite hit in the first, it, you know, it happened at the eighth bar or the 16th bar. And then I was like, oh, that's when I, I responded to, to what Tom was doing. And I, I, I said, oh, now we're in the conversation. We're looking for conversation all the time. We're not looking for somebody playing a part. Uh -huh. You know, it's not, a, you know, this is, oh, the, Tom is carrying the bass. Well, sometimes he carries the bass. But he doesn't have to do that for any length of time if he doesn't want to. Mm -hmm. It can, you know, can go into another direction. Sometimes uh, I'll bring a set of chord changes and I'll say, Tom, see what happens when we play this. And I remember once I, I, uh, I brought in something and uh, he, we played through the chord changes and uh, and I, I said, well, couldn't you do it a little more like this? And he looked at me and said, that's the first time I played this. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, let me get it in my hands first. And, uh, but he played it so well that I thought this was exactly what he was intending. And, you know, I mean, it's a usable track and we could use it, but I wanted something else. And it's, uh, you know, and eventually we played through it the second time and it just opened up to, to the, the thing that we wanted. So we're basically looking for the magic. Uh huh. Okay, that that's that's pretty cool. I I think you guys found it really great on this album. So so this record's it just came out. Uh, Persistence of Memory, which uh, uh, kind of an ode to Dali there with the title. Um, uh, the melting clock image for those of you who aren't familiar with Salvador Dali's work. Uh, probably his most famous image was called Persistence of Memory. Uh, tell tell us about that record. Well, it it started when Tom was coming through town playing with uh, Live Dead sixty nine, and I asked him to stay a couple extra days. I set up my living room, which where my grand piano is, and uh, he came over and uh, spent four. We spent four days recording, and it was kind of nonstop kind of deal. Uh, we enjoyed it the whole time uh, and it was kind of funky. I had the grand piano 
a Fender Rhodes and a couple of extra elect, uh, digital keyboards that allowed me to orchestrate them. And we'd sort of uh, flip coins for who wants to, who wants to, you know, do you want the piano? Do you want the Rhodes? Do you want this? I, yeah, I got an idea. You know, Tom would say, okay, I got an idea for something. And he'd sit down at the instrument mm -hmm. and just start playing. And I said, okay, let's try that. Very cool. You are, know, are all the tracks on the album uh, uh, live improvisation, or do you fix it up in the studio a little, or how does that work? Well, once I found the magic, I look at what I can do to sweeten it. So there, there's some overdubs that we did at the time because we knew the track was happening, but we had more to say, uh, and a few overdubs that happened when I thought, oh, you know, this needs to be led into. You'd have to, you want to, or, or for example, in Desire, I, I, I just grabbed a microphone and started singing to the track after Tom had left. And, uh, and I made up the words, it was totally improvisational, but I found these places that worked for the vocal to come in. And they were great, but I wanted something to introduce the vocal, a little distortion, a little grit that I could dig into. And so I put those in, but the bulk of it really is played live. Mm -hmm. okay. But in the recording process also, I get to record the MIDI stream. So I could reorchestrate certain things, give Tom a horn, when he was playing uh, kalimba. Ah, okay. So, so there is some production uh, creativity that you can add to that. Well, you know, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Although our, uh, our last record, our last record, Batik, was uh, acoustic piano when we just went into the studio and played it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that one, uh, 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 remember that that was like five or six years ago that came out, and that was really pretty. That was just. Uh, this is a little bit more, it's got some electronic, it's got some uh, uh, different kinds of sounds in it than just the, the regular piano. Yes, yeah. a lot of different sounds. I mean, Tom plays a, a trombone solo that is oh. amazing. <laughs> <laughs> He's playing it on the keyboard. This one's a lot more like taking the kids to the zoo. You're gonna see all sorts of things. Ah, very cool, very cool. So um, is this something that you're planning on uh, doing some live shows with? Yeah, we got some things. People are looking at some things in Chicago that we're hoping to line up uh, within the next couple of months. We've got a date that looks pretty solid in July, and we might try to build something around that. So they're starting to fall in, but we don't have anything inked yet. Okay. Well, you have an open invitation to come and play at my place. I, uh, during the pandemic, started doing small little backyard concerts. And, uh, you know, uh, if you're ever out, out my way, I'm out in Fairfax, California, I'll try to coordinate something with the two of you because I would love to hear this. <laughs> I'd love Great. to hear a lot of that live. Thank you. The extra attraction of seeing us doing it live is the awareness that we're making it up as we go along. It's an Indiana Jones kind of experience. Like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I can't stop. Uh huh. So if somebody was to come see the two of you performing, uh, would there be some semblance of maybe some of the tracks from this album or from one of your other albums? Or would it just be like, nope, this is just going to be a unique, completely whatever happens performance? It'll be. Uh, a would there be a set list of any sort? <laughs> completely unique uh, rephrasing of this album. Okay. Yeah, and, and uh, you know the, the you know certain things that we come at, we land on textures or things like we define uh, what a song is in in the most open way we can. So it could be about the texture. It could be about you know we do one thing that uh, is a waltz in whole tones. Uh, which is a certain kind of scale, or we do something that's about two chords, but it's never going to be the same. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and, and, you know, in the early days, when we didn't have a lot of our own performances to reference, we used to make up a set list 
before the show uh, by creating names that had no musical reference that we would have to go out and play. Uh -huh. So it could be Cartoon Spy and we'd go out and play Cartoon Spy, whatever that felt like at the moment. Or uh, what would, Tom used to at one point started taking suggestions for the, from the audience for encores. And um, what was that one? Canadian Hippopotamus Polka. <laughs> And then we uh, play it. That's great. Kind of like what a what an improv comedy troupe would do, where it's like, okay, we're getting suggestions from the audience, exactly. we'll just make that up. But that's brilliant. I, I love that. <laughs> I, I would ask for something generic, something ideal, and uh, what was the other one? Something exotic. Mm -hmm. And I got the idea from Terry Riley's title. Uh, Salome dances for peace. Salome is exotic, dances is generic, peace is ideal. Uh, island, of, uh, island of the Rumba King, Sunrise of the Interplanetary Dream Collector. And this became this generating machine of ideas. So I would involve the audience and ask them to help name what we're about to play. Wow, that sounds so fun. I can't wait to see this. Please do come to the West Coast and <laughs> let's schedule some shows with you guys. This is great. Hey, I wanted to share, we do have some people uh, watching on Facebook. Um, I want to apologize to folks. We did intend to be on YouTube and other channels as well, but we had a little bit of a technical glitch this morning and switched over some software. So that's why we're just on the Facebook, but I, I'll share this to the other channels afterwards. Um, wanted to let you guys know, we've got um, Scott Guberman's watching and Scott says, hey, Scott. Hi. hey Scott, his, his favorite song, Space, and his favorite album was Infrared Roses. Uh, thank you, Scott. Uh, so for those of you that don't know, Infrared Roses is an album that, that Bob uh, put together and engineered that's, uh, it's, it's a mixed match of all sorts of, uh, of different elements of the Grateful Dead drums and space and bits from the parking lot and it's woven together quite brilliantly actually. It's, uh, you put that Thank on you. a pair of headphones and you feel like you're at a show in the middle of the weirdest part. <laughs> So I don't know if that's still available or not, but that would if it's not, that's one that uh, is worth seeking out. Definitely infrared roses. Yeah, I, I haven't seen it available. And uh, every time I look for it, it's, there's only used copies. So I, yeah. it seems like it's time to put it on the uh, on the stream streaming yeah. services. That should be out on, uh, yeah, I don't know how that works in terms of uh, who owns the rights and whatnot, but that definitely should be available to people. That would be a great vinyl reissue, maybe for some record store day release or something. Hint to yeah. the Grateful Dead. <laughs> that would be a really cool one to put out. Um, and uh, anyways, oh, and, and David Gann says hi, he's watching. So a few of our, our mutual friends and Julia, Lance, hello, Kate, nice to see y'all out there. So uh, nice to know people are watching and enjoying this. So where can people get this record? Uh, they, they can get it on Amazon if they want the physical record. Mm -hmm. uh, and they can also get it streaming on most of this. That's the record, a beautiful painting by uh, uh, PJ Nunn uh, of our performance that was done at a sound check of our performances in Gualala where some of the uh, live tracks on the album are. And, uh, and so, it's, it, but it's available on most of the streaming services, YouTube, Spotify, uh, uh, Prime, uh, okay. all of those. So, and, and I wanna remind people, this is Dos Hermanos, Dos, D-O-S-E, yes, Dos Hermanos, uh, when you're looking for it on the streaming services. Uh, uh, and uh, Persistence of Memory is this album. And you, you have, uh, I saw four albums that are out there, at least on the streaming services. Uh, so. Yes, I'm trying to get uh, two more that are out of print and our rights have come back to me and sort of in the midst of trying to get them out there. Okay. Is there a, a do you have a, a, a website or is there a place someone can look or to find future information or to, to learn about gigs when you have them or? Sure. BobBrayLove.com and? TomConstanton.com. Well, that's pretty easy to remember, hopefully. Uh, very you just good. You spell my name. <laughs> it's Constantin. 
<laughs> and on the chan isn't swimming. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Um, anything else that either of you are doing that you would want to uh, share with our audience? Uh, any other projects or bands that you'd be sitting in with or anything coming up? Bob mentioned. Well, Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, uh, Bob mentioned Live Dead 69, and it looks like we will be hitting the boards again later this year. I've heard about June. And uh, that's always fun. Mm -hmm. uh, we do Grateful Dead material, except we do do it with the attitude that uh, I had when I was playing with the band. It, it, it can be different from night to night. And uh, as I put it, the guys in the band didn't learn these tunes from a book they got at Guitar Center. Uh, we, <laughs> we learned them from doing them uh, you know, with the original cast, so to say. Okay, so Live Dead 69, keeping our eyes out for that. And I know uh, people, uh, I haven't seen you, but I know uh, Mark Karen was with you guys and uh, yeah. I heard great things about the shows in the past. So definitely, well. something, yeah, definitely something we want to keep our ears peeled for. Um, and I've, I've been talking actually to David Gans uh, about putting out a, a record of uh, my songs and uh, really, quite a it's really quite exciting to think that that could happen for me because it's uh I, th I think the songs are good uh i'm really thrilled about singing them and playing them they're straighter than the stuff i do with tom which is you know over the top <laughs> and wonderfully so uh so i'm i'm looking forward to see where that goes but i imagine that will fall into place within the next six months because it's really wonderful to feel like I have David to bounce ideas off of and see where it goes. So that should be very fun. Okay. Well, and please, of course, anything you have coming up, send me the links for, and I'll share it with, with my audience. Uh, got a couple of uh, comments and questions from people on the Facebook. Uh, one person just said, loved Little Nemo in L Nightland. What's that? <laughs> Little Nemo in Nightland is uh, uh, from Infrared Roses. It's track number three. Uh -huh. And is um, when I put together Little Nemo and Nightland, I uh, uh, Infrared Roses. I wanted to, the album to start without drums, without the uh, MIDI electronics, because that's where I came in. It was it, they didn't have that stuff. So Little Nemo and Nightland is the trio between Jerry, Bobby, and Phil that rounds out the third track of. Uh, uh, of infrared roses, and is uh, the the playing is brilliant. And uh, I, what I found in doing that record was uh, because I was doing uh, I was using multi tracks from live shows. Is that when uh, during any given tour, I would find little themes that would be developed during the. Um, during the entire tune, the entire tour. So like Bobby would expose some sort of little melody that he was playing with. And then he'd, he'd uh, explore it again the next day and ex explore it again the next day. And as these things developed, uh, they would go in and out of them. So I cut together Little Nemo and Nightland from about 14 different shows where they began, we, they would explore the same themes. And so that had an arc of its own, of its own sort of generation. So that's a little Nemo in Nightland. Okay. And uh, uh, another question somebody, oh, somebody said, ask Bob about how he became Stevie Wonder's right-hand man and what that was like. Well, <laughs> uh, I was working for a computer company and Stevie owned one of those computers and I jumped on the chance to communicate with him. I wrote him some free software that was really uh, designed around the uh, use of a braille computer. And he invited me down to show it to him and we hit it off. He invited me then to to uh, make his computers, his synthesizers talk to him so he could, uh, he could program them himself. I started working on that. We did a great project with uh, uh, Ray Kurzweil. Uh, 
the futurist. And uh, then one day I was working, I would get out of the way of his recordings so that I was working on these, the, the synthesizers talking to him. And I'd get out of the way when he came in, but he'd hear me working on the synthesizers and figuring out. And then one day he said, hey man, why don't you stay for the session? I think we could use you. So that I just jumped in and that worked out great. And we had just had a wonderful eight years together touring and recording and traveling around the world. It was a blast. Wow, that sounds really great. And I honestly, I didn't even know about that until I just read this question here, but that's that's awesome and really fascinating. So you came more from technology into this. That seemed to be your inroad into the music biz. <laughs> uh, yes, it was. I mean, I was finishing a master's degree in composition at the time uh -huh. when I had to get a job. And it turned out, you know, it was the Bay Area, computers were happening. I had a knack. There was no, nobody had a degree in computers back then. You just, if you could do it, they hired you. Uh -huh. Very so cool. that was my way in. Great, great. Well, really cool stuff. Um, very much uh, appreciate the time that you guys took to talk to me. Um, and uh, reminding everybody that Dos Hermanos, Persistence of Memory is the name of the, the newest release. And, uh, oh, Tom, you, you, say something. Because then they'll see you. That's I have it on, uh, and it's still around. <laughs> we're still at it, and uh, it continues. Yes, and I, I love when uh, Bob says that we can use you. Those are the very words that Jerry Garcia said to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how did you get to be part of the Grateful Dead? I know from reading Phil's book that you knew Phil long before the Grateful Dead. How did they? How did you get? introduced to the band and and when did jerry say he needed you or he could use you <laughs> i uh I, after the uh I, I met phil at uc berkeley at the music uh the entrance exam placement exam for the music department and we met in the hall and discovered that we saw eye to eye on a whole lot of different things and he invited me to share his apartment on durant avenue i, I can say that because the building is gone it's a parking lot now and uh, then I went to Europe to study with uh, Luciano Berrio, Carlin Stockhausen, and Peter Boulez for a couple of years. And uh, that was pretty amazing. And I, I came back from that and I promptly got sucked into the Air Force where I was a computer programmer. Mm -hmm. I'd stayed in touch with Phil and Jerry all during that. And when uh, the time came for my separation, my fond farewell to my sergeant stripes, uh, the Grateful Dead was a magic carpet there waiting for me, and I, I could not possibly refuse. Uh, Jerry said those lines during a recording session for Anthony mm -hmm. the Sun at Columbus Recorders in San Francisco. Uh, I was brought in on a leave from the Air Force. I was embarrassed about my short hair. And uh, I did some tracks for them then, and uh, We'd, we realized we had a lot of stuff in common also. Uh -huh. So now you did perform live with the Grateful Dead as well, correct? Quite so, quite yeah. so. So did you have, and, and Pigman have to kind of like work out, where, I mean, you play way different style keyboards than he did, but work out where he played or how did that work out? We got along wonderfully. We wound up being roommates on the road and housemates in California. Uh, Basically, uh, I was brought in to liberate him from the keyboard. Uh, while I was with the band, he would only play on Death Don't Have No Mercy, mm -hmm. which uh, he, he proved his worth at that. But uh, it made him more of a front man. When, like when he did Love Light, especially in a lot of those tunes, Alligator. And instead of doing them from sitting behind a keyboard, he did them stage front, right in front of the microphone. So he, he definitely made the best of it. Uh, there's this one uh, part on Anthem of the Sun, the first all graceful instruments, the new potato caboose, where we're sitting side by side at the organ. And it's the only time in the recording we played together oh. at the same time. Although there was a show in Cincinnati where they had keyboards set up for the both of us. Wild. It, it was all good. Yeah. Just that's that. that's that's one of my favorite lines all graceful instruments are known i just love that so <laughs> when you hear the pipe organ uh 
I, th I think I'm Mr. High and he's Mr. Low. And we're just a, yeah, a huge pipe organ sound. You know, no Leslie, no gimmicks. And uh, just for about that long, uh, that's what Anthem of the Sun was. Uh, we were trying to do what Bob did in infrared roses with technology from a couple of decades earlier. It was an overcompensation, a response to the fact that people were complaining that the first Grateful Dead album didn't even come close to recreating the experience of seeing a show. It seemed, it seemed like it was channeled, funneled down into these little grooves and it, it just didn't work. So we overcompensated, like I see, like I say, say, see, so, so. And uh, one thing led to another. That kind of prepared me for what we're doing now. Wild. All right, everybody. So that's your homework assignment after this broadcast is go listen to Anthem of the Sun, a new potato caboose with some uh, new insight. <laughs> Listening to it fresh again. Yeah, very cool. All right. Um, well, I do have a, a couple of videos I want to I'm going to close out with. But before I cut to the video, is there anything else that either of you would want to share or tell us uh, musically or anything? Oh, Politics, yeah. news. <laughs> I'll think of it next week. Very good. Well, you're welcome to come back anytime. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, TC. And thank you, Bob, for for taking this time to to talk with me and to talk with the audience here on Deadhead Land. And uh, I've got a couple of videos of Dos Hermanos to play. Uh, maybe maybe you might want to introduce the first one, either one of you. The, the first video I'm going to play is called Waltz of the Autumn Moon. And this is actually a live performance, uh, the two of you. And then the second one I'm going to play is a, a video of a song called Bubbles. So either one of you want to tell us about the songs before I cut to them? Oh, Bob, you're muted. I think the waltz is us, uh, an actual video of, our, of us performing. Yes. So you can yes. get a little bit of the taste of us making it up as we go along. Uh, but and, and there's a video. And it, 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 it is acoustic pianos on that, two acoustic pianos. Okay. So Waltz and, of the and, Autumn Moon, and the we're going to hear that is, first. That's two acoustic pianos, and you guys are actually performing live. So this is a taste of a live performance. This is a track that was included. On the on the CD, so there's acoustic pianos on the CD as well. Everything's on the CD. You know, it's like all kinds of sounds. Okay, and then the the second video that we'll play is a song called Bubbles, and this is a a, a video that someone made to go with the music from the album. Yes, somebody uh, a, a a friend of mine, uh, Gregory Roman, uh, said he was uh, thrilled about when he heard a. a uh, early version of the record and uh, asked if he could do something. And it's just a brilliant little voyage, a visual voyage that uh, uh, sort of expresses the uh, bubbliness of peaking. Oh, well, very good. All right. Well, thank you again. Thanks to both of you. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to just cut to some music now. This is, uh, once again, Dos Hermanos. The new record is Persistence of Memory. And here we are first with uh, uh, Waltz of the Autumn Moon. And no sound for some reason. Give me just a moment there. Should we hum our parts? It's like what this morning was like. <laughs> yes. Maybe we should maybe we should sing our own parts. Boom 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 boom. Oh, no, no. <laughs> well, let's talk about something else. Well, you know, before anybody tunes out of our videos. 
Here we go. Oh, well. I have a woodpecker in the backyard. Oh, do you? Oh, there you, yeah, really. We had a rattlesnake a couple months ago. How fun. I have a friend who became friends with a rattlesnake family that was living under its house, his house. Yeah. And he didn't pet them, mind you. You treat them well, they'll treat you well. <laughs> exactly. Well, that sounds like a prepared piano.
Thank you.